All right, so uh, intro to InfoSec challenges, uh, and my name's Forgotten. Um, so a little bit about me. I've uh, been working through every InfoSec challenge I can find on the internet or in person that I can feasibly play for the last year and a half, uh, as well as doing an insane amount of research online to try and populate a project to document all of them. Um, it's and been a very... Hmm? And going to college at the same time. And going to college at the same time, along with many other side projects along the way. Um, so we'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, so basically what I'm going to cover is what are InfoSec challenges, why bother, um, what do you need to start, what do you need to win, and where can you find more information. So. Uh, InfoSec challenges are thought-provoking competitions that basically involve some sort of puzzle or game. There are a variety of different types of these challenges. Um, Jeopardy style is one of the most popular because it's very, very easy to set up. Uh, it could be web-based or local and you can just throw up a Jeopardy scoreboard and put in 20 or so questions and run with it. Um, attack, obviously you have a static environment that people attack, and that could be a lot of VMs, but it's not super complicated to manage. Um, defense gets a little more interesting depending on who the attackers are and how much they cooperate, um, and the skill levels relative between the groups. Uh, both attack and defense in one competition is really difficult to manage because people always break the rules of engagement. Typically it happens in attack and defense as well, but it's even worse with attack and defense because some of it is in scope, some of it's at not. And then King of the Hill, which is similar to attack and defense where you're actually trying to take control of systems and keep other people out where you don't originally start with control so you have emergency patching and all kinds of interesting twists to the game. Um, so why do they matter? Um, first and foremost, it's good training and practice for basically every type of skill in InfoSec, there's a matching challenge somewhere. Um, motivation to focus, so basically a lot of us like puzzles and games. Um, is there anyone in the room who doesn't like playing puzzles or games of some level? You're a liar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, all, we all tend to draw towards that category because it's a much more interesting way to spend our time. We would all I've not met anyone who would rather listen to lecture in a classroom or read a book than play a game if it, the end result is the same. So there's a slight difference in the amount of factual knowledge you can learn from it, but I think it gives you a more real world learning experience to actually play these games. Which is why I started this project, because it was the fastest way for me to force myself to focus an absurd amount of time to learn quickly. So, obviously, how to get start, um, creating a team of people uh, really helps. Uh, so leadership definitely helps because dragging a group of people to actually show up and participate and God help you if you try and have them plan, um, it can be rather difficult, but fun at the same time. Um, learning Linux, obviously, kind of important to anything in security. There's lots of tools that are only available in Linux or almost not feasible on Windows. Um, basic web exploitation is in a lot of challenges um, because it's one of the hot topics right now. Um, everybody seems to like to create their own web exploitation challenges and post them online so there are tons out there both statically and within challenges. I don't think I've seen a challenge that doesn't involve some sort of web app exploitation. Uh, assembly and reversing is another category that is almost in the vast majority of competitions and it's also the most difficult uh, to get started because the prerequisite to generally learn assembly sucks for most people, um, including myself. Uh, network analysis is very popular, uh, Wireshark learning how to use it or similar tool set, uh, T-Shark is also very helpful. Um, there's many other versions of going through PCAPs that can be useful to learn this stuff. Um, if you're really lazy and Windows user, 
Uh, Network Miner parses out a lot of the information for you, but there are limitations to that. Um, cryptography, again, falls into much of the aspects of a lot of these challenges, and the basics of it will fall into almost every type of challenge, uh, except for attack and defense, you really don't need as much crypto experience but it does get heavy when you start to get into the Jeopardy-based challenges, which is the vast majority. So, uh, Constant contact for web exploitation is a very uh, beginner challenge, set of challenges that I really like, and we'll go through that in a few minutes. Halls of Valhalla um, is awesome because they have a variety of challenges, and that's just a basic web challenge online. You log in, create an account, and there's a just about hundred different challenges you can play and on top of that you can actually submit more so users all the time are submitting new challenges to add to the list um, and fighting for the top spot I know some of the guys from my college are trying to stay at number one and solve every challenge except for the ones they make uh, Cypher is a good set of tools and whatnot for working with crypto for the basics uh, so going to get into some demos to show you guys these aren't super complicated to actually play and work through some of these challenges. So, as mentioned, Constant Contact, this is the first challenge. So, generally, viewing source is pretty much the first thing you do um, in a lot of these challenges. So, when you look at this, what stands out to anybody? What looks a little different? Anybody? Secret.js. Yep. So, click on secret.js. We have a nice little basic unescape string. Um, if you're not familiar with JavaScript, unescape deals with encoded material. So, we'll just copy that into our nice little tool. Paste it. And it goes ahead and decodes it for us. Uh, this tool is really nice because it actually gives us a variety of formats. So, I tend to use this a lot. Um, so, secret.php. All right, well, what happens when we take a look at secret.php? Level two will be harder. Um, again, this is a very easy, simple challenge, but this is the basics. Um, and it gets harder from here as we go through various challenges. Uh, so the tool that I had set up for this one doesn't actually seem to be showing up here. I don't see it, so anyway. So number three we have everybody's favorite SQL injection. Um, a lot of these challenges use basic SQL injection or getting into more advanced SQL injection as you get to the harder challenges. Um, in this case it's a pretty easy uh, SQL injection. And unfortunately, that's hiding it, which kind of sucks. So, it is admin single quote dash dash single quote. Uh, basically, what that does says, I'm sorry, wrong one. I am losing it. Uh, options. Boy, this really does not want to work for me. Alrighty then. Lovely. All the tools I had set up don't seem to want to work. Of course, demo fail lives on. So, one more time. Let's try this again. So, uh, number four was nice little picture here. I mean, look, the source address is not permitted. Well, that kind of sucks because I really want to get into this. Let's take a look at the source. We see display.php. It's kind of interesting. So let's see what we can play with this a little bit. See what happens. So in here we also see admin.php, which we'll see in a moment. So if we copy this lovely little URL here, get rid of the view source. We have a nice little broken image. 
Let's take a look and see if we can download this image. See what happens. Hey, what do you know? So it opens it automatically in a as a uh, picture, but let's see what happens when we open it with something else. Or this machine wants to hate me. Yeah. So when we look at it in a, note, a text editor, we have admin.php, it's source code. And WordRap doesn't hate me. So no matter what, it's going to die. It's never going to work if you try to access it by changing your IP or doing anything else. That's literally just to have fun with you. Uh, but we do have the secret phrase, and it's not that bad in this case. So. As you can see, these challenges get more difficult as you go up through them. Um, so, they're a lot of fun, and they serve their purpose. Uh, so, this demo is not going to work, I don't think, at all. One second here. Uh, So this lovely executable, which happens to be a live piece of malware, uh, was part of a challenge and they specifically told us about a hundred times, do not run this. I'm sure some fool actually still ran it just to test, but um, the goal was to actually go out and find the domain that it connected to. Um, fortunately, I can't really show you strings where the actual binary is packed and you can't see the URL that it connects to. But through Lazy Man's tools, similar to a new, uh, part of uh, Grex's talk earlier, he mentioned Anubis, which gives us this lovely report, which shows us all kinds of fun stuff about what this actual binary does. So when we go down through this, and we find somewhere in here, DNS queries. Hey, Russian Business Network, not us, you. Ah. They had a lot of fun when creating this. Um, this was actually a, a binary that was created for a class, but had a challenging aspect to it. Um, a lot of times we'll get in challenges real malware or real whatever, and they may mess it up so it won't actually run. I've seen them delete headers to make sure you can't accidentally run it. I've seen people do all kinds of interesting things with binaries. Uh, typically, you end up having to do much more uh, IDA-like stuff to actually get these binaries to work and give you the correct answer. Um, sometimes you have to change various things with IDA or some other tool set to get them to give you the answer, whether it be connecting out to get the answer in the competition environment or just unobfuscating it. And they go kind of far to obfuscate these challenges. So. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, let's see. so networking. Um, again, we have a good amount of PCAPs that come through that we work through in this particular challenge. Um, we were asked to find the flag, which was eight hex characters starting with MCA dash. It's actually for a challenge organized by MITRE. And when we open up in Wireshark, we see a whole bunch of data. When we open it, this way we see a nice little stream with the uh, very start. Has a little bit of crypto in it. Um, has just a string that ends in equals equals. Um, when you start with crypto, you start to see patterns. Equals equals or single equals or three equals generally mean base 64. So when we copy that into our nice little decoding tool we saw earlier, we get len256, cipher des, mode ecb, with a nice code of hackers1. Pretty simple. So when we actually go through this, uh, find where it is. No.
Uh, that is not the challenge I was looking for. 200. Uh, so, when we Google for Des Decoder, if I could spell decoder, which I apparently cannot, we get tools for noobs. And we can copy in the nice little key of Hackers 1. And in this case, we'll get rid of the unimportant stuff. Go here. When we look in at the hex, um, we see ASCII looks a little screwed up in this section here. Looks different from the rest, so we can surmise that most of it is crap. And that section is what matters. So if we copy the important parts, which don't really display right in ASCII, given you have a lot of various characters that aren't being displayed as anything but dots and Wireshark. So go over here, dump in this, filter out the garbage, hit decode. Now as you can see the text for this sucks. It doesn't give you any reasonable value and if we copy that into our tool, and tell it to try and decode. Uh, it was ECB. It takes time. There we go. So we have a whole bunch of junk that doesn't look like anything. But if we take the base 64, which we figured out by this lovely option down here at the bottom. Thank God we f happen to find a tool that has this option. When we decode it, we have a nice clean string that happened to be the flag. So, again, not super difficult, but until you get the idea of playing these challenges and the types of solutions that you would expect, you can't, it takes a little bit of learning to get there. Um, as you play these challenges, as you read through, various write-ups you learn what to expect and you learn how to solve the puzzles. When you're just getting started it can seem quite daunting but as you play through challenges and then read how people did them after the fact if you were either way if you were able to solve them or if you weren't being able to read someone else's way of solving them can sometimes give interesting ideas. Um, So this one was a particularly interesting one, um, the 100 level version of that same challenge. When we went to the web, uh, we went to a website and literally all it gave us was, hello doctor. We're like, what the hell is this? So we're messing around with this. Um, th th this challenge was actually kind of weird in that it made us use uh, some of uh, Andrew's toys with creating a SSH tunnel, uh, which is why you see the really odd looking connection there with a local redirect. Um, you actually had to netcat to um, both 2012 and 2035, the year the challenge took place and the year the movie took place and actually have a conversation off the script of iRobot via netcat and at the very end it gave you the flag. So th this was a really interesting one. Um, it was really bizarre. I'm really not sure how he got to this point except for Googling movie script and hello doctor and finding the right movie, uh, which was really odd. But eventually he figured out what the movie was. Um, that's right. The, if you gave it the wrong response, it said, uh, said the line from the movie where it basically is, you must phrase the question in the right way. I forget the exact wording from the movie, but basically if you answer anything but a scripted response, then it would tell you you have the wrong question. So he eventually figured it out. It was a pain in the butt, actually. Um, getting there. So for some of the crypto problems, um, we've got a pretty good variety of different challenges, if I can actually go through the right part of the doc. That is not what I was looking for. One second here. Finding the right spot.
Figler challenge was really odd. So they just basically gave us a bunch of strings and said, here, go find the flag. Um, so this first one, again, pretty simple. When you look at it, it doesn't have equals, which is typically telling us it's base 64, but given the characters used, guess once or twice, it's a one or level problem. Base 64 is not too complicated to guess at it. It ends up, congratulations, you've solved the first basic challenge. And it gets more difficult from there. Um, Caesar Cipher, which basically shifts the alphabet. Um, the most typical version is Route 13, which is a 13 character shift. Um, again, not super complicated. There's tools online that will actually do some of this for you and find the answer. Um, you go through and they get more difficult as time goes on. Um, at bash, which is substitution cipher, the verse alphabet, Morse code, again another Google Morse code translator and throw it the input and it will give you the output. And it goes on through different types of ciphers that you get more familiar with as you play more challenges and work with more crypto. Uh, their advanced version kind of surprised me in that it was literally, here's a PGP key, or GPG, excuse me. You have both the key pair, and we'll give you the passphrase. Go figure out what the messages are. So literally, P GPG running decrypt on three files gave us the three flags, which was ridiculously easy considering, but a lot of people had problems with it. Again, this particular one was targeted towards undergraduate students only. Um, not always true. Uh, not always the most difficult challenges are open, but in this case, they made it pretty easy to start. Uh, the last two puzzles that were marked advanced crypto were a lot more difficult. They gave us a PG, or GPG key pair, but they didn't give us the passphrase, which was really kind of shitty. Um, cause we were like, okay, how do you brute force a GPG passphrase? So after a few minutes, we found that there was a uh, John the Ripper plugin out on GitHub that one individual had written that could actually do this. Um, within the three hours of this competition, we couldn't get it set up. It just, there wasn't time with all these challenges. Uh, there were about 30 challenges in this particular round, and we had about three hours. It didn't happen, but we solved it anyway later just because we needed to. Uh, again, the aspect of the puzzle, regardless if the challenge was still running, we still wanted to figure out the answer, just because we were pissed off by it. Um, in the long run, it was same format of NCL dash, four characters, four numbers. Not super complicated, but it took forever. Um, in a three hour time frame with all the other problems, this was near impossible. No one actually got it within the time frame. Uh, crypto can also have fun with steganography, um, and they get much more difficult as you go through strings, obviously for the first one, kind of, I don't even consider that crypto at this point, but um, in this particular case, they had um, adjusted the image so that certain portions are off by one, uh, one value, and you had to go through and find the area that was off by one and Magic Lasso would actually get the flag out for you. And it gets much more difficult as you go through with different types of secret messages hidden in these particular challenges. Um, I've seen four or five different challenges that have used these crypto type problems. Uh, others will have different types, depends on who's playing the ch or who's organizing the challenge. So that uh, NYU Poly hosts one of the largest challenges out there, the largest run by students. Uh, it has about 700 teams. Um, this is one of the particular challenges uh, considered forensics, although I'm not entirely sure I agree with that being forensics, but they gave us a picture. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, when you open it up in a hex editor, there is a ton of text comments, uh, which you see one if you open it up in XF tool and take a look at the metadata on it. But you see text comment key and a name, which there's about 500 of them. So we were really confused as to how to actually figure out which one's the right key. Um, in this case, I wish we would have known this at the time, but 
PNGs, when they because of compression, actually do CRC checks, which is a hashing algorithm throughout the file, and every chunk is actually uh, create its own hash, and it stores those table within the file so that you know there has been corruption. A certain amount is allowed, and it doesn't really give you an error unless you check. There's a nice little tool that was written to check, and if you knew about the tool, you could find that this particular key had a CRC error in it. Uh, you could theoretically brute force this, given it's only 500 numbers and well, it only takes about four seconds to submit one, if that. So, you know, you could brute force it. The only problem was the next problem had 9,000 names, just for memes' sake, um, and to prevent anyone from brute forcing. Um, Rowdy, the same method worked, except for it was the one without a CRC error. Again, same type of problem. Uh, pretty simple if you know about the tool. Uh, a lot of these challenges, you will acquire a tool set and a way of thinking, hey, how could this happen? Or what, could, what tool could find this? So the more you play, the more you end up learning uh, throughout these challenges. I don't remember whether I pulled so Brad, this one. You, yep. Have you developed your own, like, um, you know, like a, a, a CTF image that you use? Because obviously, as you go through this, you start building up tools that may be one offs, but you may end up using somewhere else. So, have you ended up just having a, an image or a box of this is my CTF box, and I have, you know, I just keep making notes and tools so that uh, I have these resources available when I go to these? So, I've started to build up a tool set. Um, mine is particularly not dealing with assembly because I'm terrible at it. Um, I let one of my other teammates focus on assembly, but I have built up quite a bit of tools uh, towards that. Ah, crap, I didn't actually post that. That one's going to be fun. All right. So um, as you go through these challenges, you do build up those tools, and nobody will actually share them, really. Um, oh, damn it. So I have not built up a tool image yet. Um, as I add tools, literally every challenge I do, I add something. Um, I most commonly use Backtrack as a base and uh, another tool set called Samurai Web Testing Framework, uh, which has a significant amount of web exploitation tools in it, um, a lot more than Backtrack does. Uh, sometimes I throw together SIFT and use that, which is the SANS Forensics Toolkit, SANS Investigative Forensics Toolkit. Uh, so I use a variety of different VMs, and a lot of times I will download and compile tools for individual challenges. Um, John the Ripper is another one that I have a separate backtrack image that I need to blow away and set up an actual dedicated uh, John the Ripper image with the one that can do GPG passphrases since that was a nice pain in the ass to find. Um, I have not built a single VM that has all the tools and I'm not sure it's reasonable to. Depending on the type of challenge, there's a lot of different tools. Um, the more you play, the bigger your tool set gets, and literally, there, it would have to be just an enormous image to get everything. Um, I like what I've done with, hey, here's one that's specific to web testing tools and web exploit tools, uh, one for forensics, one for general exploitation, one for password cracking that specifically has more power and more CPUs and more everything. Um, generally, I do the password cracking um, either out in EC2, which is probably the best solution. Uh, if you have a GPU cracking box, power to you. Not many of us do. I think the only one I know of who has one uh, laying around is uh, PW Crack. But uh, other than him, I don't know of anyone who has one. Um, building one is a fun option. I've seen tons and tons of different designs for them. Everything from clusters of Raspberry Pis to all kinds of other crazy stuff. I don't think the Raspberry Pis are a good idea. But 
Um, the tool sets get very, very different depending on the types of challenges you play. Um, I keep about six different VMs in total as, with different tool sets available. I can't really make one VM that will do it. If I could chime in here, um, from my experience of doing this, getting a DSXI server will help you a lot. Mm -hmm. So you can store a lot of VMs on there and fire them up and down. Plus it allows you to have multiple team members uh, be able to remote into that. Mm -hmm. And then they can be working on different things um, all at the same time. Um, you can get one for about, depending on how serious you are about it, or depending on your team you may be able to a lot of companies will put together teams and use a training budget to help fund this um, a lot more companies are starting to realize the importance of these challenges as training and a lot of them have started to put together teams for more of the uh, high visibility challenges so that they can show how awesome their employees are and train at the same time. Um, more technical groups as well as certain government agencies have started to put together teams for a lot of these challenges, sponsor them, create ones of their own. Um, MITRE's put together their own challenge for undergrads and their interns purely for training purposes and they allow undergrads in because why not? Um, a lot of different companies have donated to make this possible. Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, which is a uh, college-level competition across the country, uh, which we have lovely red team members here for. Um, there's dozens of sponsors. They use it for recruitment. Uh, a lot of the sponsors and a lot of these challenges use it as either visibility and or recruitment because uh, CCDC, for example, if you play as a college student, you have to give them your resume. Although I don't know why you wouldn't want to unless you already have a really good job. Um, they actually basically force you, if you want to compete, to give them a resume. And all the sponsors are given copies of those resumes. So that's not unreasonable to expect if you do well um, in the regionals, and if you, especially if you get to the national competition. Um, the winners often get very, very nice job offers the second they graduate They're by winning. Required to. So all the companies that sponsor national CCDC are, are, have to put a bid in for the winners. So they, the, whoever wins the CCDC actually gets a job offer on the spot after they win. I thought it was after they graduated. A job offer on the oh. spot. And I've heard most, if not all, of those end up being around the hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, coming straight out of college, a hundred grand is pretty nice. Um, I don't think you're going to get too many other better situations. So uh, that particular one, uh, again, they have over two hundred colleges around the country that participate every year across ten regions. Each region sends its winner to national competition. Um, it's a lot of fun. I want to see if I can get them to actually put a sponsor's blue team in for comparison. I think that would be really interesting. Uh, I don't think it would go well. <laughs> uh, considering the sponsor would want to have that kind of PR. Uh, I don't know. One with that's a little overzealous and uh, believes they're awesome might just do it. Who knows? I, I don't know. I haven't pitched that one quite yet. Um, but I think it would be a lot of fun to see that happen. And throughout the competition, various vendors give trainings to the participants. So, for example, Tenable from this area goes around and forces everyone as part of the challenge to install Nessus. And various other tools get their little plug-in and teach students on how to use their tools, which is kind of fun. And the vendors obviously love it. Um, so research. Uh, as far as challenges, um, reading... 100% of our team that went to SECCDC all had multiple offers for jobs, um, you know, within probably about two weeks. So. I would say most of the teams that compete, who do well, have offers. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, research. Uh, 
Write-ups, again, I can't stress this enough. When you play the challenges, there's solutions to a lot of the write-ups that a lot of teams do. Um, when you, The teams that post those write-ups found a way to solve the problem. You may have solved that exact same problem, but if they did it a different way, there's value in learning. Again, that's the root of these challenges, besides the actual puzzle of solving it, is actually learning. Um, reading those can provide valuable insight to how other teams think and how just different options for solving problems. Even if some things that don't work for any particular challenge can be useful later. Um, the problem with CCDC, though, is that nobody does write-ups. Um, not many teams do, and they're very difficult to find. There are some. I've compiled almost every one I can find, but I've found information about nationals. I've found information about four or five different regions. Uh, and most of the red teamers from quite a few regions. But a lot of the reason that they're not out there is because there are some of our own techniques that we're not yeah. willing to share. So. Why? Uh, a lot of it has um, been scraping individual blogs, Reddit and Twitter and random blogs and team websites that they accidentally or intentionally leave public. A lot of times we'll have a lot of that information. Um, whether they mean to actually release it or not. I've found a lot of teams that have posted stuff. Um, it does take a ridiculous amount of time to make that search and go through all the crap. So what on IRC suggests ctftime.com? Yes, uh, that is the... Uh, so, started this the project of actually documenting competitions about a year ago now. Um, about four months ago, a group of Russians actually decided to create a kind of overall scoreboard for all the challenges um, that they play, which is kind of sketchy. Uh, that part of the site most people don't care about because it is blatantly giving them the advantage on their own scoreboard. But the uh, listing of competitions is extremely good. Um, I make sure that I have pretty much all the same information on my site, and they've gotten a whole bunch of write-ups off of mine. So we kind of share information, intentionally or unintentionally. I talk to them literally the week they started up. Um, they've gotten a lot of buy-in from the teams by forcing them to create logins and claim their team to get points across each challenge. So even if a team does really well, if they don't log in and you know write, hey, we're this team we did this challenge, they don't get points for it on CTF time. Uh, he does some, there's some automatic uh, assumptions with that, but anytime there's a team name change or you know, whatever, it won't pick up on it very easily. So you have to put in every alias you've ever used, and sometimes the scoreboards screw them up. So parsing that can be extremely difficult, or at least they don't try too hard, either way. Um, so because a lot of the bigger teams who do really well and win a lot of these challenges have gone on there and done that. Uh, they've gotten a lot of use, especially in Europe um, and among even the top teams here, like uh, PPP, who absolutely destroyed in uh, Ghost in the Shell Code this weekend, um, as well as a lot of the high-end teams ended up going to them because it's a scoreboard. Regardless if it's kind of sketchy and kind of favored towards them, they want to make their. They want to get their team out there. They want their write-ups to be used. I mean, if they're going to put effort into actually writing clean and good write-ups on how to solve some of these problems, they want people to view them. They want other people to learn. Um, CTF time. It, it is a good site, ignoring their main scoreboard. Uh, it does have a lot of information. It does have links to a lot of write-ups. I quite often grab the write-ups links that they give and link to the same people on my site. So, uh, let's go back to the actual point. Um, reading the write-ups is very useful. I strongly recommend anyone looking to learn, read through them. Set up the scenario in your own environment, and that could be an extremely good practice, both in learning how to create those environments, which can be useful to build your own challenge, and just as a practice environment, it, let's say one person builds a challenge, another, the rest of the team plays it. If everybody does that, everybody learns. 
So how to win? Obviously, you're not going to do. It. You're not going to win by yourself. Uh, you're facing another team. They have a group of people that's competing against you. Unless you are that much better than them, you're not going to beat them alone. And even then, it's still near impossible. Everyone has different skill sets. Within every team, people focus on something. You may have your crypto guy, your web guy, your uh, binary guy, or a couple binary guys. You may have a couple guys who focus on web apps. You may have a person who does forensics. Basically, people pick a specialty. Um, definitely cross-training is extremely useful, but generally there are a couple experts in any given topic. Um, get experience through playing the challenges. I mean, the more you play, the more tools you learn about, the more situations you learn about, you gain a lot of valuable knowledge. Practice, practice, practice. Um, it's been said in every sport, every game, every competition, practicing will help you win. Um, obviously, learn, reading write-ups and solving problems yourself will, that's about as good a practice you can get. So, I strongly recommend, um, if you've got the time, find some folks who are interested, put together a team, play some of the challenges. Even if you're not able to solve a single question, which is the state I was in on the first challenge I played, it can be useful because then you go back and you read the write-ups and you say, oh, I could have done this problem this way. I knew how to do that. Or, I have no effing clue how they did this. But this is really cool. Let me go learn about how this was done. Now I know for the next time I see that type of problem, this is what I can expect. This is what I can try. Or something similar. Have fun. Um, at the heart of this, they are training, they are useful, but they are also games. Um, or puzzles, depending on how you look at it. There's a lot of learning to be done, and it's a lot of fun to play through them. Does anyone have any questions? Do you share a lot of these write-ups on your, your site? Every one I write, I post on my site. Um, sometimes CTF time copies them, sometimes they don't. Can you show that website again? Yeah. I thought I had it actually in the slides. Uh, upcoming CTFs. Get back to that in a second. Uh, So it's ctf.forgottensec.com. Um, the very beginning of it is some resources I put together, but go down a little more and you get to competitions. These are competitions with set time frames. Um, they have the registration date, qual qual any qualifying dates, and the finals for each challenge as they post them. Uh, also, if it's online or in person, obviously competition in Korea, you're not going to go there typically unless you're really, really dedicated or really, really close. Um, this is an international sport, so not really all local. Um, Codegate, which is uh, the one in Korea, is coming up. Uh, Have you thought about um, syncing up with setcore.info to see if we can... I have not, although that is a good idea. Like that way, um, they take care of your schedule. Yeah, not all of these coincide with conferences. No, um, uh, yeah, but obviously not, but the, having it on a calendar would be nice. Yeah, um, I have not done that quite yet, but it's a good idea. I'll definitely take a look at that and talk with the folks at Secor and see what we can do. Um, so I'm going to continue as we go through these challenges. Uh, we go down further, we have continuous challenges, online practice sites, uh, stuff I haven't filed yet that are just all over the place, practice VMs for pen testing. A lot of the skills and a lot of the offensive-defensive competitions, you end up working with pre-vulnerable VMs, in some cases pre-owned VMs that already have netcat listeners running on odd ports and all kinds of other crazy stuff, whatever the organizers come up with, some of which is really, really nasty. Um, a lot of these VMs are designed for learning pen testing, which can be really helpful and good practice if you're into pen testing. Uh, yeah. uh, the next section that I've been working on for the last few months has been the training section. And this is basically just different things you can learn about along the way. A lot of these have not yet been filled out. 
Um, as I come up with an idea of something to write about, I create at least a link. All the ones that are read have not been touched. Yeah. How does someone contact you to add more stuff? Uh, I'll show you that in one second here. So, as this just loads, right on the front page is my email. Um, surprisingly, the bots have not actually messed with this. Um, I have not gotten any spam from this link, which is retarded. Uh, I'm sure some of, someone on this link will fix that. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, additionally, it is open for anyone to edit. Uh, you click on register and create an account, and anyone can edit it. Uh, I have added to the filter to try to get rid of spammers as best I can, and it's gotten a lot better. Um, at one point, it was around 100 a day, uh, which is a royal pain in the butt to deal with, but I make it happen. Um, as uh, I had originally said, as open edit, where anyone could edit anything, with backups, of course, that are offline. Um, some nice Ukrainians decided to replace the front page with some Viagra ads, and that changed. Uh, so now you actually have to register, fill out a CAPTCHA, which they pay the Indians one cent to click, or whatever, whoever they pay. Um, they pay somebody, because there's way too many accounts that I've banned, way too many IP addresses I've banned. But uh, I try to make it as easy as possible for people to edit stuff. So literally, if you go through the 10-second creation process of making an account and go edit stuff, it gets edited. Um, I review the changes, and they're live before I review them. I just check every day or so and delete all the crap ones and revert as needed. beauty of wikis is it's very easy to revert changes. Um, to give you an idea of some of the stuff, uh, just the basic Linux administration page, which most of us in here are fairly comfortable Linux. Start off with some of the real basics, how to add a user, how to delete a user, blah, blah, blah. Getting into some more difficult stuff, um, well... Stuff nobody bothers to look up. The actual contents of the password file, literally what every single column means. Uh, obviously, the username and UID and or UID and good. Uh, a lot of people look at, but home directory, user info, and shell. A lot of people don't think about. Um, also, the Etsy shadow file, uh, a list of what the actual uh, hash types are, and how to how to know that number six in the beginning is a SHA-512 hash uh, hash password um, also this format right here is how all the file or all the actual passwords are stored um, MD5 doesn't have a salt but anyone with a salt there's a section with salt and then the hash um, stuff like what does a bang mean when there's an account with a bang in the password field what does a star mean Useful stuff. Uh, not many people actually bother to look this up, but it is out there. Um, and also the file where you can actually edit what the password is stored in. Again, somewhat basic, but until you've bothered to go find out, because some system you were dealing with had every password stored in MD5, uh, you don't go find it. Um, took literally me finding a box that I was like, oh crap, every password's an MD5. This isn't going to work. And I went and found the module and figured out how to change it. Um, go into file permissions, some of the things that uh, people have screwed us over on in CCDC. Stuff like the immutable flag. If they change a password, the red team that is, and then they make the, the Etsy shadow file immutable and you can't change anything in it, you can't change that password anymore. If you don't know that attribute, yeah, even as root, even if you chmod 777, which actually someone told me would fix that uh, earlier this week, uh, which we, it was kind of funny. Uh, when you chmod 777, your, yeah. your shadow file. Um, but knowing about attributes is, again, somewhat basic, but at the same time, unless you've seen it, unless you've dealt with that, a lot of people don't know about it um, and how to change those attributes. How to find all the immutable files on a system. This was a nice little script that a guy named Jason Ray uh, wrote. He wrote a nice little tool set that's out there. 
um, for offensive defense, just finding cool little stuff. This is a nice little script he wrote about finding immutable files. Um, something which I'm sure Mid Atlantic is going to love to do. Talking mm -hmm. about immutable files. What? Huh? Yeah. Um, looking into information about shells, the easiest way to kill a shell. Uh, stuff they do to us every time. Um, listing open files. Listing what files are open now. Hmm, I wonder. When they're editing stuff, I wonder, could it be useful to look at what they're working in? Right. Yep. So, I've got a lot of information here. Some of it hasn't been filled in. But as I get more stuff, I add to it. Um, it's been a project for the last year. I've put in as much information as I can. Hoping more people will add stuff to it. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any last questions? All right.